Okay, say go. They go in the Hordalans. Waga don't ha her day, she gone to this away. Then all need you, Scanners, they want to join you. They hold out Gerard on the works and order. Jeremy Green, young gets. Waga Tahuni, then all Oswego, eight and all need to bag it. Ganyake Haga got it on a duck qua. On gate Nigolo, they are nise, there's a warunka. So I greet you all. I know you don't speak Mohawk. So I'm going to switch to English for the rest of this presentation. Uh, my name is Jeremy Green. Deho dot Gerardo. People call me Deho. Everybody say Deho. Deho. I am Wolf Clan from Tainanega Mohawk Territory where I grew up. And I moved to my wife's reserve about 17 years ago, Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Mm -hmm. Who was here in the last presentation? Raise your hand, please. OK. How many of you are teachers? Oh. Yes. <laughs> I am a teacher. This is a session for teachers, administrators, songwriters, <laughs> professors, learners. Teachers. Yes. OK. <laughs> so I have to stand back here because I have to click this little button, you're all so far away. Um, the session's gonna discuss feedback. I've been a teacher, my first job in 1993 was as a day camp summer student at the first ever Tyendinaga Mohawk Immersion Summer Day Camp, which ran for two months. I worked with Gardy Wahawe, Dorothy Lazor. Some of you must know Dorothy Lazor. Gardy Wahawe, yes. That was my first experience seeing how Ganyang Gehar, the Mohawk language, could be taught. And she said to me, she said, you should become a teacher after you become a speaker. And I said, how giwahi? I'll do that. She said, all right, let's do it. And uh, over the years, I think I learned, learned more teaching than I probably taught my learners. And what I learned the most about was teaching. And teaching in Ganyangeha, and teaching in my language specifically. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And I had a chance to watch and observe how they teach. And when you go there, it's, it's really amazing. You hear all these kids, they're all speaking Hawaiian. Then I learned a little bit of Hawaiian. And then I started listening to the kids in the kindergarten, and they're just talking, and the grade one, and they're all talking. And I heard, ah, oh, that little boy made a mistake in his language use. That little girl made a mistake in her language use but they sound very fluent. In my own teaching, I'm listening to the kids in my class constantly make errors, make mistakes in their language that they're trying to get out. We know it's not easy. I taught a third year course in adult Mohawk immersion program. I listened again. They make all these errors in their speech. Um, I was hired to evaluate an immersion school 350 students, um, three grade three classes, three grade four classes, et cetera, et cetera. Really big school. So I got to observe 12 classrooms. And the exact same mistakes that those children were making are the exact same mistakes that the children in my classes had been making. And I thought, ah, there's something in this. And so over the years, I started thinking, how do I give them the quote unquote right way to say something without killing their desire to use the language? If you're constantly told you're wrong, you're incorrect, you didn't say that right, generally this happens. Clams. They clam up. Nothing comes out. Um, the last person to speak in Geha in my family was my great-grandfather who died when I was five. 
I remember him talking to me. And I learned as a second language. And I learned in a time when kids generally were seen and not heard. So I had to break that barrier down and change the way that I interacted with my elders. Where I could be that pesky little kid that said, hey, onio de sirdo giga. Onio de sirdo tigo. How do you say this? How do you say that? Nahora gondo tigo. What does that mean? Nahora zado. What did you say? How to ask for all these things. So in this session, you're going to hear why is it important to elicit conversation, dialogue, and interaction on topics of learner interest and choice? That means, yes, they're going to talk about their Xbox 4 or whatever they are, they're on now. Or yes, they're going to talk about their tablet. Yes, they're going to talk about their hockey game. Yes, I'm going to give them an opportunity to do that in my classroom. Another question, what is the feedback cycle? I'm going to engage in a conversation with these learners because I want them to speak my language as a communicative device. I want them to choose my language, even though it's not their first language, over English. I'm going to let them choose sometimes what they want to talk about, SpongeBob. Oh, did you see SpongeBob, what he did to Patrick? Like, no, what is that? Oh, what's that gato gone? Oh, no, what's that saying? It's SpongeBob. <laughs> or I might ask them, I might say, Oh, what's that gone? So what happened then? And stop the whole class and let that person, that little boy, have a chance to tell that. He wants to be heard. He's choosing English because it's very easy for him. He doesn't have to think about it. It just comes out. How do I get that little boy to choose to do that in Mohawk? Another thing I want to look at in this presentation, what are the most common errors of speech made by learners in your language? I want to give you some time to think about that. I'm going to share some of the most common errors in my language with you. Um, what are the most efficient forms of feedback for your language. Everybody knows repetition works. So if the kid says, uh, I want to know what go out again a puck. I shot the puck. You'd say, oh, ojikwa, kid, ojikwa. Yeah, that's repetition. Did that get that child to think of that word on his own? No. no. I gave him the word. Am I going to be constantly there beside that child his whole life to get constantly feed him words? No. So one of the questions is, how do we provide feedback to our learners in a way that gives them the time and space and the skills to be able to stop, pause, think, get out what it is that they want to say? How do we do that when we have a stack of math curriculum that thick to deliver in our grade four immersion class? How do we do that when we have language arts this thick? How do we do that when state standardized testing is coming in for grade four and six? Am I going to give that child the time to talk about his hockey game? Am I going to take the time to correct his language through feedback? The other part of this is, some of you have probably been teachers a really long time. You know what errors they're going to make. You know when they're going to make them. How do you plan lessons to preempt them making those mistakes. OK, I'm doing a unit, grade five. It's on force and motion, science and technology. I'm going to integrate that with this language arts block. OK, I want them to write about this. I know they can't do it to the level that's required. I want them to give a report in the language on some force and motion. I know they can't do it in the language. I know they're going to make these mistakes. Well, how can I plan to give them the language that they need to succeed and master the curriculum? It's generally, state-imposed curriculum. That's what we're going to talk about. First, the Six Nations. So I'm Mohawk, Ganyakehaga, and we have these other five nations who live with us at Six Nations. That means at one time there were six languages spoken there. 
uh, about 200 years ago, there were nine. We had taken in nations from the East Coast in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia who had been displaced by the English and then the Americans, and they came and lived with us. And after leaving New York State, after the American War of Independence, we all settled at Six Nations. And so at one point, there were nine languages down to six. Now we're down to three. Six Nations only has speakers of Mohawk, Cayuga, and Onondaga left. You can see here, this is Lake Ontario. That's Toronto. East. I had to come across four time zones to get here. And this here is our original territory at Six Nations of the Grand River. This is what's left, this little wee reserve. Our languages are polysynthetic, comprised of all these little parts and pieces. Our languages are verb-based, um, tens of thousands of verbs. Our best speakers know which very specific verb to use in very specific applications. How do you give that to your learners? So we know that we want to, for my people, everybody wants the kids to speak the language. They want them to become speakers. They expect this to happen in elementary immersion schools. We got the idea from the French, 1979, Gahnawage, in near Montreal, Mohawk community started an elementary immersion school. After 30 years, there's a guy named Jim Cummins at the University of Toronto who did a study. 30 years of immersion uh, for French in Quebec. And what he found was that elementary immersion was ineffective in creating proficient speakers of French. They could speak a quasi-school jargon of French, but actually be able to communicate with speakers. They couldn't do it. And the part he, that he said was missing was accuracy. That the children were very fluent. They could read and understand at a level comparable to native speakers of French. However, when they spoke, their accuracy was far below expectation. They made a lot of mistakes. We want them to be proficient. How do we get them to do that? In academic language skills, to build in a second language learner takes six to eight years. Even if you have a daycare, let's say we had a daycare in Mohawk, we send the kids there for two years. Then they go to kindergarten. By the end of grade four, they should be acquiring this academic language, which we know, for most languages in the world, takes six to eight years to acquire. So then we think, is that realistic? To expect these kids to master this academic language that most of us have to learn just to teach it, if we were to teach in English, how do we expect our kids to do that in our Ngwehongwe languages? That's a tall order. Not impossible. So we know that little Johnny comes into kindergarten, we'll say, in the elementary school. <clears throat> he has zero support at home. Maybe his grandpa speaks Mohawk. None of his parents do. Dad's not around a lot. He's gone. Now we expect this child to succeed and to develop capacity to communicate and use the language at the school. So he's going to go through this process here of interlanguage. He's going to start out making a lot of mistakes. He's going to get better and better and better. And eventually, he's going to be a speaker. If you were in my presentation previous to this one, we kind of defined what a speaker is. And so we know that for our polysynthetic Mohawk language, that we have a stage of language acquisition that English does not have. Exponential acquisition. This is where our learners master all the structures of the language. They can say, Onknino, I will buy. Wakknino, I bought. Ti gazare wak nino, I bought that car. Ti gazare da hetgong wa eh nino, ne get me stung. My mom bought that ugly car. They could 
they can take the language, they can twist it around, they can make words, they can insert all these little parts and pieces, and they do it just like that. Now, for those of you who have raised your kids in the language at home from birth, your kids can do that automatically. My kids can do that automatically. How do we get kids who didn't grow up with a speaker in their house to do that? That's the challenge for polysynthetic languages that are verb-based, this stage here. In an adult immersion program, that takes 1,800 hours where the sole focus is on teaching them how to manipulate those little parts and pieces. English doesn't have that. Hawaiian doesn't have that. Most of our languages here have that. That's going to change the way we interact with our wee little guys who are put into this immersion school and expected to speak in our language the whole day, which is not their first language. So we want to know, how do we help them? How do we support them? And so, from this big study that went on at Six Nations, came, uh, this was the most effective approach for teaching our language the most efficient approach to creating speakers at the advanced mid-level of proficiency according to Actifil. Now, if you weren't here, the study, 104 teachers of Cuga, Onondaga, Mohawk, elementary, adult, immersion, native second language programs were interviewed and asked, and people who become speakers, what are the most effective teaching methods for our language? See structures, it's all little parts and pieces. Interaction, that means no paper, no pens. We're doing some kind of activity that's guided, it's structured, it's in a safe environment. You're learning how to manipulate all these little parts and pieces. So the interactionist approach requires interaction. Watching, listening, deciphering, moving, doing, this is the kids, speaking, interacting. Generally best delivered through task-based language teaching, language tasks. Uh, there's a whole bunch, we can, we're going to talk about that later. You want to push them to this. Breakdown. Now we know it happens a lot. Kids in the elementary immersion school, teacher will say, command them, well, time to go outside. And you see little Johnny running outside and he doesn't have a coat on. You say, oh, so Giada, we put your coat on. And he says, Nii doesn't have an Ajada we. I don't have a coat. And you think, why did he say that? I don't have a coat but he puts English in there. Why did he say it like that? It's because he doesn't know what to say. Maybe he never heard anyone say that at the school. He has no one at home to talk to. So we want to push them to this. We want them to do that. That's okay. That doesn't mean I failed as a teacher. That means he's showing me that he needs a language for how to say that. I want to put my students in as many situations as possible that brings them to this breakdown. He's just trying to communicate with you that I don't have a coat today. And then there are ways to give him the language in that moment that let him communicate to you where he would say, I don't have a coat. Instead of, I don't have me is a they don't experience anything like this in their teaching in the school? Yes. Very similar issues across all of our languages, across all of our elementary immersion schools. Even with adult second language learners, college university programs, Nate Saga, it's the same. So we have this thing called feedback. So feedback is any indication to a learner that their use of the target language is incorrect. How I learn, if I made a mistake, the older speakers would just look at me and say, 
Now hold it, Jiro. What do you mean? Or they'll say, "Yet did go here to That's not right." Or they laugh. So you have to be really strong. <laughs> but times are they're changing. Kids don't respond to that where I'm from. They don't like being told I'm wrong. They generally give up. They stop trying. They clam up. So they think, well, how do we empower these kids? So we want to increase their ability to speak the language for real when they need to and what they want to say. If I'm constantly talking about parabolas and integers and, um, you know, how do they get that language when I'm trying to deliver this mass, massive curriculum? So we have this thing called feedback. This is the feedback cycle. What we're trying to build is automaticity. The language automatically comes out of their mouth. They don't really have to think about it. In order to build that, we have to provide them with opportunities to speak. Easier said than done. So what they have is a thing called input. This is the language that they hear. If all they hear is me standing at the front of the room commanding them to do things, all they're going to speak in is in commands. And from where I'm from, I know that's true because I've seen it. Comprehension. Say I tell this wonderful, eloquent story. How do I know if they even understood it? The theory is they hear the language, they understand it, and then it starts coming out of them. So what happens when all they're hearing is commands? Then they hear this awesome story. They have no idea what I'm saying because it's their second language. And then I just keep rolling with the lesson and then wonder why they didn't succeed in mastering the curriculum requirement for math, science, social studies, that sort of thing. So we have input. They comprehend. Maybe little Johnny does get it and he wants to say something. Well, it comes out, but, oh, he made an error in his speech. Now I'm going to decide whether or not I'm going to correct that error in that moment. And it happens this fast. This is how I'm talking now. So let's say I'm going to provide feedback. I'm going to show him in some way that what he said was incorrect. Hopefully the feedback leads to uptake, meaning he took what I said, he said it, and it made it quote unquote correct. And then we go back to talking again. There's more input. So we'll Another way, teacher and student converse. The teacher notices student error in speech. Teacher decides whether or not to provide feedback. And you generally have to stop your whole class and take the time to give this child the language they need to communicate. Then you're going to deliver the feedback. You're going to get a response. If there's no, you want self-correction. If there's no self-correction, you go back over here, you notice the error, and you go through the whole thing again. Maybe you give up. Maybe eventually it works. Maybe you keep going in the conversation. So there are two kinds of feedback, positive, negative. Positive means that you show them what is acceptable and correct. Negative means you tell them that they're wrong. Positive feedback is the best form of feedback. Negative feedback is second best. Zero feedback, or not telling them at all that they made a mistake, is the worst. Mm -hmm. Half the time, they don't know that what they said wasn't correct. Even adult learners, they don't know that what came out of their mouth was not, quote unquote, the correct way to say something. So there's a fine line between getting them to communicate, building the willingness, and shutting it down with too much feedback. So you want to keep them talking. Like, well, how do we do that? How do we correct their errors and Keep them talking. In the literature, I did a research, or, um, literature review. 
I found six methods for feedback for English. Then I branched out. What do other languages do? I found another one, seven. I thought, that can't be it. There must be more. So I went and observed 12 classrooms in this elementary immersion school, and I found five more. Methods for feedback that are specific to my culture, to my language, to my speaker. So every language will have these culturally appropriate ways to provide feedback to your, to your learners. So the first one, confirmation checks. So a confirmation check, the teacher repeats to the learner what the learner just said in order to understand what the learner meant. For polysynthetic languages, this commonly means changing one little morpheme. And they reflect and they think, aha, uh -huh. okay, what does that sound like? So I have some audio here. So you see, you can tell this child's been constantly spoken to in command forms because they're talking to me in command forms. They're using the you pronominal prefix all the time. So what I did was here, I asked them, oh, sa da de wei and they finally said, ha, wa ga da de wei and and Anybody have the same problem? Okay. Clarification requests. So these are statements where you want them to clarify what it is that they're saying. So this one doesn't have any audio. Okay. So let's say an 18-year-old student is having a lunchtime conversation with the teacher. So we have right here. The 18-year-old says, Oya si te donare, wa ke not dare na se ne ke yon a. The teacher says, Unka kari? Who? The student says, Ne ke yon a. The teacher says, Sabir da yon gong. The student says, Oh, ya ya da. Ne gi da ke gong a. What cannot the rain not say, ne, Kate gone ah? Can you hear it? Kate gone ah, Kate gone ah? That's a clarification request. Repetitions, now, in my observations, this is the most common form of feedback in most Mohawk elementary immersion schools. The learner makes an error, the teacher says the word, the student repeats it, that's it. Done. Did the student think about what it is they had to say? No. So this one here is a mistake in pronunciation. So we're talking about bottles, and the student says, Gatseda. And I'm saying, Gatseda. There, Gatseda, Gatseda. Teacher then calls on the same student a while later with the same subject. The student says, Gatseda. Teacher says, Gatseda. Yes, ma'am. Pardon? Colon in the teacher. Right here? Yeah. No, in the word. Right here? Gatseda. Yeah. So the student is saying, pronouncing this wrong, they're saying, Gatseda instead of Gatseda. Gatseda means the stress goes down and lengthen. <laughs> there you go. Gatsida. Recast. So the teacher rephrases what the student said in order to get out, elicit the central meaning of what the student's trying to say. So during a break time conversation, the student is telling his teacher about an outing the night before with his friends. So the student says, so then I went and picked up my friends, and, we, and you and I all went to town. So the error is here. 
What junki yadakwe? That means to go like this to somebody. The other part, Dewa, they said, me too. But I didn't go with them. So the teacher says, oh, so you went and picked up in a car your friends and you all went to town. The student says, yes. I went and picked up in a car my friends and they all and I, but not you teacher, went to town. Do all your languages have the same thing? Exclusive, inclusives? Very complex, okay. Recast continued. So the teacher re reformulates or expands an ill-formed or incomplete utterance in an unobtrusive way. So the same teacher and student are still talking and then the student says, so then we went to a movie, but they say, What that means is, then a movie there we went and came back. It doesn't make sense. So the teacher asks them, De oh, so you went and watched the movie. Then the student self corrects and says, Ha, huh, de yoyaks wa aguareroroge. That's what we want. We want them to self correct. This is my favorite. I love this one. Silence. I do this with my kids because they go to the elementary immersion school, they come home and they speak this quasi pigeon mohawk that's a school language and they'll say something and I just go like this until they change it to the Mahadi uh, Wanana, the full language. And they know what it's supposed to sound like. So, student one says, Oh, nanara genues. What that means is I like potatoes like a friend. So I just go, and the student says, oh, nanara wa gegas. I like the taste of potatoes. And I'd say, ni oni. Sometimes I used to say, oh, jadorno ga, that's your friend. <laughs> and they'd go, ah, yeah, yeah, uh, wa gegas, wa gegas, oh, nanara. Is everybody kind of following along where I'm going with this? Okay. <coughs> Facial expressions. My mother was great at this. <clears throat> Similar to silence, but you can raise an eyebrow. You know, the eyebrow. So this student says, Etoone ista wa irdo. Sayo don suriza gadi. Then, mom, she said, finish up your work then. So I go like this, because that student's calling me mom. The word in red means that's what you say to your mother when you want to talk to her. You stop. So the student says, Oh, wa irone a get ni stoha. So my mother said. Does all this sound familiar? This is what you hear in your classrooms? Okay. Walkie Charles is here and he did a whole dissertation on very similar? Okay. The next one are translations. Um, these happen a lot. The fancy term is code switching. The students will use their first language to insert the names of things that they don't know how to say in our language. So this one is an example. A student is sharing with his classmates at lunch about beading a bracelet. So the student says, Bracelet. Bracelet. The teacher says, Oh, I did not son ha ga wa se yunyon is at nista. The student says, Ha. Huh. Generally they say, Ha, huh, I did not son ha. So you're giving them word, the word without showing a book or showing a picture or you're just kind of giving it to them in the real time. These are the ones I added after observing what my people do what our teachers do, and most of them were first language or native speakers, elderly teachers. Now, so the learner stalls for a word, they might use the wrong verb root, they might insert English. The teacher makes a motion, movement, pantomime, something, to let the learner know what verb or noun root to use for what they want to say. So we play lacrosse, it's our game. 
Um, our kids talk about it all the time at class, in school. And so this student says, you can follow along with the English here. What get kwe ne ojikwa? A tone no ni um mm shoot at it. Teacher goes like this. Student says, What garun today? And the teacher goes like this. Then the student says, Wat goyak ge? A tone no wat goyak ge? Wagyak de. I took a shot, so then I took a shot, I scored a goal. What they did was they inserted two other words that they thought meant to take a shot in lacrosse, but it's a very specific word. So we're giving them very specific language here. I saw a teacher stop, take a marker like this, and what happened was the student was trying to get out what they wanted to say so fast. It's like a grade three student. They're so excited to tell this story, they just want to get it out, and they're making all these errors. And the teacher says, Oh, hey, can you slow down and tell us the story? And then they start telling it, and the words were all in the wrong order. And so the teacher basically took a marker and drew a series of pictures of what the student was going to say, and then paused the whole class to do this and let little Sawadis there tell his story. And he did it. And he did it right. I was amazed. And all she did was draw those pictures and give him time to think. I thought that was pretty cool. That's not in any research literature I've read so far. Prompting with phonemes. Now, these are the little sounds of the language that don't have meaning, but you need to know in order to write the language. So if they're struggling for a word, this one student said, you can follow here. No one to go Call of Duty. Um, um. Well, I know he's trying to say, "Did you play? Did you ever play Call of Duty?" <coughs> Kids ask these teachers these things all the time, and uh, so I start saying the phonemes one by one of the word. Wa, de, k, g. Student cuts me off and says, "What dek g quarekko?" I played a video game. Then the student says. Hey Deho, no wonder go on Call of Duty. What deschi quarekko? That's what we want right there. And they take it and they put it in the whole sentence and they ask me the question again because they want to talk to me. Because I'm a real person like them. <laughs> want to talk about things they want to talk about. We can also prompt with morphemes. Now this one, I gave them the verb root. We have tens of thousands of verb roots. And so the student, same thing. No one to go Call of Duty. Um, um. Did you ever Call of Duty? The teacher says, "At gani." At gani. The student says, "Wasat gani." No one to go Call of Duty. Wasat gani. Did you ever finish Call of Duty? So you can see I gave them the root right here, and they added the other pieces, the you and the did. And I gave them the time to do that. The other one is storytelling. This one's really good if they make a mistake or they don't know a word for something very specific to your culture. So you might say, oh, OK, and then okay, what happened then? Yeah, OK. And oh, Yoni, what guard? I have a story too. And then you tell them this little story that shows them without you saying, that's not right what you said. You should say it like this. You tell them a story, and you think, those kids are smart enough that they're going to pull the language out from that story that they need in that moment. And they are. From my experience, they do it. And so this one's really useful for um, paraphrasing. Like when um, they say, oh, then John said, then Missy said, then Turtle said, and Gustavo Iago said. They make mistakes of that all the time. So I just need to switch presentations here. Now, 
I hope to get finished through this in the next 15 minutes. I wanted to take some questions, but I wanted to give you time to sit and think. What mistakes do learners make in my classroom? What mistakes um, do learners commonly make in my language? What strategies would I use? What forms of feedback could I use to help correct them? What do I use now? We know that repetitions and translations are effective for giving them words. Does it get them to think about what it is that they want to say for themselves? No. We know that confirmation checks and recasts and the storytelling offers them a model that they have to listen to, they have to think about, then get something out. That's kind of, that's what we want where, in our teaching. So I've been thinking about for my languages in particular, what are the most common errors? So I'm going to show them some of them to you. First one are phonemes. These are the little sounds. So a lot of words get mispronounced because in most cases, those little kids in your class, you're their only example of the language they ever hear. Where I'm from. That's it. My adult learners at the university, I'm the only Mohawk language they ever hear. So, you can see the little red mark. This is what it would sound like. It's commonly one letters off. Or you don't say, you're wrong. Like uh, you kind of <laughs> try to give them an example of how to say it. So a student hears the teacher using an unfamiliar word that they decipher the meaning to. The next day, the student tries to use the word in a conversation, but attempts to change the tense or the aspect. And this is what we want. So you can see they put the, they said it with the proper accent, pronunciation. Now this is generally the biggest class of mistakes for Mohawk because English doesn't have that, this. This is the most distant structure of our language that English does not have. All these little parts and pieces that have meaning. That if you change one little piece, changes the meaning of the whole word. This is what most of the feedback in my class is directed at with my learners. Morphemes, morphology. So we have an example here. You can see the red, that's where they make the errors. So we'll have a listen. You see the error? What did he call me again? <laughs> he called me mom. This here means will, intent of future. You can't negate the intent of future. You can only negate the conditional future. So he changes the en to an a down here, and then that makes it right. Ya ya tagadori. We're trying to make something that's very, very complex, very, very simple. I like this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say we're doing a task-based language assignment where learners have to tell another student a story about their morning routine. Like, how do you get ready in the morning? So what he converts with John. So John is talking to George. So he says, last night, my parents and I went out to eat. And then we went to the arcade. But the error is they added this S, which is a habitual aspectival ending, which is wrong. Oops. 
So then George says to him, see, he models the proper wat jug wat ska. There's no S on the end. So our learners constantly mess up the front and endings of these words. So we're kind of showing them how it goes. Students are given a task of baking bread. As they are baking bread, they are sharing information from the recipe about steps of the assignment. Bo, Biff, and Billy converse. So in this one, we can see Biff is using command forms only. And down here, the teacher uses repetition as a form of feedback to show them how to take it from a command form in the U pronominal to I would. Well, listen to that one. Now, words. This can be a problem where you have native speakers in the family. I think it's a great problem to have. What I mean by this is, Flo is a little girl, visits her great aunt who is 94. Her aunt teaches her a new word in Mohawk. Flo is so pumped that she got this awesome word, she wants to use it in the classroom. So we'll have a listen. I'll translate for you as we go. <laughs> All right, everybody, are you ready to get started? Flo says, wait, wait a little bit. <laughs> Teacher says, what did you say? Flo, it's my daughter, she says, uh, Sanuna, wait, just a little bit. It's very polite, this word, it's very rare. So then the teacher says, well, what does that mean? This is where your teacher doesn't know how native speakers say things sometimes. Flo says, it's almost the same as wait, impolite. The teacher says, oh, well, say wait. And the little girl says, wait. Now, as a form of feedback, the teacher is maintaining the parameters of their knowledge and what they know. But to this little girl, imagine how that little girl would feel. And this happens. Oh. Uh, what level, grade level is this? Um, I've taught grades 1 to 6 in Mohawk immersion schools, and this kind of thing happened in grade all grades. All grades? All grades. All grades. They hear words from other people, <coughs> How many years and they try to use them. Or semesters do you teach them up to this level? Um, everybody I interact with constantly who's a learner. If I see them in the community, if I see them, I use this process of feedback because I'm putting this teacher role. Or, um, and I know like my elders, my mentors would do this for me. They do it in different ways. But this feedback goes outside of the classroom. It brings the language to life. Um, it enlivens all conversations. If you think about if English is your first language, or even a Ungwe Hoi language is your first language, you'll remember back that you were, people always corrected you when you were little. So it's the same thing, but we're trying to do it in different ways now. Right, so you would use this anywhere, at any time, with anyone. So, this one here, now, okay, so this one here would be about a grade five or six. They've been in the elementary immersion school for a few years. They can say quite a lot of things. And so they're talking about their personal interests. And this one guy, he's talking about it. So he says, so this would be uh, grade five, six, or adult immersion, or adult second language. So Ayerdon, which means clown, says, oh, I really enjoy planting a garden. And the teacher says, oh, what do you plant? All kinds of corn, mush melon, green, bean. <laughs> this says, it's green, a bean. Teacher, silence. 
So again, the teacher goes, he says, you know that a green bean. It's long. It's a green colored bean. You eat it fresh. You see how that worked? So they were trying to say green, string bean, green bean. So they put ohande and osaheda together and they thought that was right. But speakers would say or hochiri, string bean. It has its own word because it's important to us. So, what else we have? Here's the Ni'i Zajarabi one. Another one is word order. This is a big one. And a lot of times, students try to use English intonation with words they think are question words, but they're not. Sound familiar? Okay. So in this one, you can follow along with the English here. Well, listen in. <coughs> students are practicing with partners in a language task wherein they have to interview their partner to determine if they know the whereabouts of their friend. Itchy and scratchy converse. <laughs> so the no no is not a question word. Gatke means when. We don't have intonation like in English. Maybe your languages don't either. So you have you use words to indicate a question. Because of the English influence, itchy wants to say no no. But no no is just when, it's not a question. But you self correct after I said, Nahorajiro, what do you mean? So that's a clarification request that I used to elicit feedback. Ah, this is a good one. Listing things. This is a novice level skill that most kids can do in kindergarten. Most adult language learners can do in the first few classes. You give them word lists or something. We'll have a listen. So they put and, 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 and all I did was ask them what they saw without using, with only using one and, insert it in the right spot, and then he turned it around and he got it. So instead of me making a huge grammar lesson and going to search for a book and typing up a great big long grammar exercise written down and covering it in class time, all I did was take two seconds to repeat back to the learner what it is that they were trying to say in an appropriate way and then they got it just like that. So forever now that learner will know if I'm going to list things, I just list them all and I can put and in there at a certain spot. Mm. This one here has to do with word usage. Is anyone finding this useful? So kind of, so well, as we're going through these, I want you to think about your own language and think, do, does my language have that? Do the students make those errors? How would I correct that? Culturally, uh, in, a, in a culturally appropriate way. <clears throat> or as a student, how would I want to be corrected? Would you want to be told, that's wrong because the nominalizer and the coincidentalizer and the translocative aspectival suffix isn't the same as that. You do that to a grade six kid, they're just like, you do that to an adult immersion student, they're just like, this avoids all of that. You put the wrong aspectival prefix suffix combination together with that verb root and you didn't use the semi-reflexive. Did that, did that keep going in the language? No. You squashed it. Totally. So this one here has to do with word usage. So you can follow the English here. Yeah, 
is a very specific word for wearing shoes or having shoes on. Most students don't know it. Most second language learners don't know it. So they'll say, If we want to teach them the specific word, we just kind of give it to them here in a sentence. And they get it right away. There's no English, there's no lengthy grammar explanation, it's just feedback. We stayed in the language. This next one is context. Uh, we already did this example in the last presentation, but two students meet up in the hallway before class starts. Very informal, very slangy. These are people who know each other, young people. Now, let's say a young person meets an older person who they don't know all that well. They would not talk like this to that older person. They would be a lot more formal, and they would say this. So how would you show your students that what's appropriate and what's not? It's challenging to think about, how do I show them that that's not appropriate for them to walk up to our, this elder who will come into the school and they say, hey, Nahono Gardi Hwan Nagarde. That would be like, who's this kid? I have second language learners who are adults who text me all the time for words and different things just to talk and one of them says, Skana uh, Zena Dunya, at the end of our conversation. I'm like, am I not at peace? Why is he commanding me to be at peace? And it's rude. But they don't know that it's not rude. You should have said, Skana Agohak, let there continually be peace. And that's the quote unquote appropriate way to say that. But he thought it was right, what he was saying, but I took it as rude. Ah, this is a really good one. Someone's uncle passed away. And Leah, the one whose uncle has passed away, is consoled by her friend. So she says this. It's great that they're staying in the language, but, right? Who says that to someone? Oh, that's not good that he's dead. You're saying, like, he's dead. That, that is the all-encompassing word that this student knows, that they'd be familiar with. Now, there's a very particular way to say it. It sounds like this. Because that uncle comes from a certain clan and a certain side of the house, um, you saying, I am sorrowful of what has happened to all of you. That's how you offer condolences appropriately. You wouldn't say, oh, I'm sad your uncle's dead. It doesn't, the, the culture um, necessitates the response. It kind of tells you um, what's appropriate. So we want to model this for our learners. So where did, where did Fred come up with that, um, that more um, respectful way um, sharing condolences? Some of our second language learners will go find native speakers and they'll ask them or they'll text. A lot of texting goes on now. They'll text um, somebody in seven hour drive away and say, hey, Neil Gia Sirno, um, my condolences to you all. And the elder will send it back. They'll Skype with them, FaceTime. They, um, Facebook chat groups, uh, the Mohawk language, something or other has 4,000 members. You want to know a word, you say, Neil Gia Sirno, Giga, Dragonfly. You put it up there. There's a bunch of speakers who look at it and they'll say, oh, Jiggy Nut Warista. That's how you say Dragonfly. And so that's, that's how you kind of get your help. FaceTime one and Skype is really good because our communities are spread out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the trick is to help learners master each structure in your syllabus and build their accuracy through feedback that keeps them talking. So you want to keep the conversation going in a natural way. And if you want them, if you want them to be speakers, they have to have opportunities to converse. So, you have any questions? I know it's three o'clock. You've been sitting down for a while. As a student, I'd be going crazy. Um, questions? Yes. I have one. Um, 
picking this, being here all week and then picking your politician, um, I really am going to go back and look at my native language lessons and curriculum and really look at it really good and see if I could just uh, put it in an order like this where students could start learning their language more. Awesome. Yes. Um, in, in your bio, you mentioned that your first one was some of what you put together to develop from the Waldorf model. Yes. Can you talk to me about that? I mean, I'm just wondering about that. Wednesday, both sessions will be just all about that. Tiki, oh, okay. Teaching with imagination, teaching with uh, through drama, play, art, um, getting them to interact. Yeah. Right. Um, this is informed by my own teaching practice where I had one class, zero parent support. So I realized I was on my own in my classroom, I was on my own at my school, and I knew that I was the only model for language that those kids had. So I had to be very inventive, resourceful, and considerate of student needs. Not my needs as a teacher to show that I can teach my class this whole curriculum and deliver it in this professional way and my report cards are all in on time. I had a mandate from my administrator to teach those kids to speak the language. That is priority one. The people at the top have to say, do what you have to do to get these kids speaking. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about both sessions, how to get kids speaking and deliver um, a state mandated curriculum. How many speakers are there? Where I am? Uh, and there are many, many speakers. Um, at Six Nations there are two for Mohawk. The whole Mohawk Nation there are 930 total out of 60,000 of us. And those 932 are native speakers and we're losing them very quickly. Uh, I say within maybe six nations will have zero speakers in probably five, five years. But there are 25 of us second language speakers who are advanced mid or higher on the active level. Um, we have 12 bilingual children. So we're starting to replace more speakers than we're losing. So we're, it's sad that all of our native speakers are going, but um, they're encouraged because they can see that there are other, others now. Because we have our other speakers still in our eastern communities, we can go to them for help. And that's where IT, technology, uh, plays a huge part. Mm -hmm. Yes? Similar to the way that I um, teach INSA, <clears throat> we have what they call um, an outdoor space, which means e eating, using, wearing. So instead of using the, the wearing shoes, we use that outdoor space truck or truck or that. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> when I came to work here um, and started teaching conversational, um, just by telling them the words and stuff didn't work. They had no, because uh, there's no prerequisite for what to see. So um, I figured them out really quick. I started write, writing some verbs down. Mm -hmm. Where are the negative starting verbs too? So then um, I would ask them, uh, like, first person and third person. Are you are you tired? I may not teach. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm tired. I may not teach. And then to the I ask the uh, the guy sitting there, the third guy. I may not fa in video. And then he would have to say, "Be at me not fa." That way, I get them to um, talk. But I, I had a hard time trying to get them to speak because um, yeah. they 
they were shy. Um, they didn't want to say their, their language, even the, there were some some natives, and then there were, I had all kinds of Japanese, um, uh, you know, all kinds of races <coughs> there going to their So hmm. we had fun, um, especially one guy. Um, I was doing a homework. <coughs> I don't know what you learned um, to be a, a phrase. And every time we <clears throat> go to class, the same I would say on the carriage of um, After about three or four times, <clears throat> we'd say the same one, you know. And pretty soon the students got wind of it, what he was saying every time. And then the last time we said that, they were laughing. <clears throat> it changes conversation, you know. Right. So, yeah, it was, it's it's definitely not easy um, and uh, tomorrow's sessions um, I was hired by the Six Nations Language Commission to write a teaching manual for our Six Nations languages <coughs> of methods that get students speaking and there are over 200 methods in this manual <clears throat> there's a seven stage approach that kind of ties it all together <coughs> and I experimented with that approach for a few years in an elementary Mohawk immersion school and it quote unquote worked. All those students increased their proficiency. Um, I had people in the community saying, I talked to so and so, they can actually speak the language. And that was over three years. So I'll be talking about that tomorrow. So methods, like how to get them speaking, how to put them in situations um, where they see the language modeled for them then they get to practice with it. Kind of like a flight simulator. If you're going to create pilots, you give them some training, you put them in a flight simulator first, then you send them out in an actual real plane. That's kind of the approach that uh, take. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, well, thank you. Um, nice um, to back to that session. Uh -huh. Really good. Um, I'm wondering, you know, when you talk Um, we, so the Six Nations Language Commission uh, hired me to write the manual about a year ago. That year-long study that you saw in the last presentation, that was in 2015, 2016. So the results are just coming out now to be known. And so I was hired to host a series of professional development days <clears throat> for Six Nations district teachers this past uh, winter. So just now they're starting to Ah, okay, this is what we can do. Ah, that's how he did it. Ah, that's how those kids are talking. Ah, that's, so they're, they're just being shown now. So I figure it will take um, several years for mastery. The other part of that is where Six Nations Polytechnic is creating its own language teacher education program where that teaching manual will be the foundation of three whole courses. So we're going to train our own people how to teach our own languages to our people. So you see any resistance because of oh, yeah. being such a brand new, brand new thing? Um, there was, in the first session I remember, there was this elder Kyuga speaker, and she's a teacher. She understands Mohawk too, because it's multilingual, our elders. And uh, she wouldn't participate. She's just like, just sat there. Which is, God, Gwen, that's her choice. Free people, right? Oh, really? And I didn't take it personally. Three months later, she came back, and something had changed. She was all for it. She had an assistant who works with her, and she said, "I used some of those things you showed us," and she saw it, and she's all, she's all for it now. So, with change, change is never easy. It's always hard. Uh, we've been teaching the French model, direct method, just talk them in the language and they'll get it, model for the last 35 years. We know now that that doesn't create speakers. It does not work for us. So, do you know what um, I tried. I, I had a parent night under the Waldorf model. You have a parent night once a month where they would come in. Um, <clears throat> I would get maybe 40, 50 percent participation. People, they didn't choose the language to be their lifestyle, but they chose the language for their children. 
and they put it on me to give it to them. <laughs> yes? Um, I was just curious, um, are any of the children, uh, like in the Eastern region, are they coming uh, from uh, a French as their first language at all? Or are all the children English as their first? It's all English. Some Mohawk, very rare. It's really awesome when you get a native speaking child in your class. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, they're working on it right now. Like that meth the teaching manual, I just submitted it last week. So you were all emailed a copy of it. <clears throat> so whoever comes tomorrow, you should probably, um, I would suggest pulling that up. Because I want to talk, I don't like talking all the time. <clears throat> I wanted to um, explain it a little bit and then give you time to get in your language groups and work with it right there. Think, could we use this to plan lessons? Could we use this to plan units? Could we, wow, look at, for speak, for speaking, he has 40 different activities you can do. <clears throat> I can share this, yes. Um, I can save it as a PDF and email it to, what are their names? <laughs> yes, and they can put it out to everyone. So, yes. Where do you find time to just nicely write out all your lessons? <laughs> Summertime. If your administrator is slick and they can tell you in May, the end of May generally, you will have grades such and such <clears throat> in September, then I had time to plan. So I would use my summer to plan. And then my evenings, my weekends, my holidays through the year when I needed to catch up. <clears throat> well, you know, your teachers, you know how it goes. You could spend your whole 24 hours planning and not sleep. So I use my own time outside of school. Because I love my language, I love the kids, so. Yeah. Um, to think about, I have some questions up here. <clears throat> I'm not sure what languages you speak. What are some of the most common errors your learners make? Are there patterns for them? Pardon? Are there patterns for them that they yeah, could? There, there's, a, there's a diagram for them. Oh? In, in the grammar book. In the grammar book. Okay, thank you. Yes? Um, with Kinget students in elementary school, they can understand a lot of what we've taught them, especially in the second grade group, because I've had them since kindergarten. I only have them for 30 to 45 minutes, four days a week. Um, but one of the common mistakes I see is when they're predicting to say something in King It, like something I've never taught them to say, they'll use English grammar structure, and that's just one of the biggest things I've noticed. What would be your suggestion for remedying that? Being preemptive and saying, okay, I know they're going to do that, so how can I, what methods can I use to preempt? Well, uh, as part of my literacy lesson, I will put those patterns up there and leave a blank line and elicit, them, elicit responses from them on what would, what would make sense here, or just doing oh, it, no. just telling them this is this is how we this is the pattern. Once I see that, they're ready for that. I don't just say this is the pattern. It's more organic where someone will ask me a <coughs> question or I'll hear a mistake and then I'll just say, oh hey, it's like this, and then that it'll tell other kids and next thing you know they all know it. Mm -hmm. Cool. <clears throat> what I see is uh, among my own students I only have 30 minutes every day with them right now. If it's kindergarten or first grade graders and I get them right up in the board and have them repeat after me. But when they get older than that, um, 
I explain that I start teaching you in present tense, but we don't always talk in the present uh, conversations. So when they're uh, older, sixth grade on up, um, I teach them this, you know, the past, present, and the future, and also the uh, um, one person to two person, and I explain that to them, I write it down, and I have to memorize it, and I could hear them speak uh, among <coughs> each other, speaking in perfect English, because it's, everything is just a burst in English, and then um, I try to match that, because I, I wouldn't accept it if uh, they're, they're just saying it in which in, um, any old way, because uh, their English teachers wouldn't accept them just saying, speaking English any old way, so, so um, I have them say it uh, correctly. And I help them with it, I tell them there's no, uh, we're not cheating, you're learning. And, uh, I really, uh, and then I praise them, reward, um, fun games, and stuff like that, so, and then I talk to them. That's, that's really important, is, is talking to them, but talking with them. Um, I never had prep coverage for three years, so I had to, right, I had to cover all, my, all the recesses, all the lunches. Uh, this is a private Mohawk medium school. Now, the medium school was made because they were children whose first language was finally Mohawk. When you get children whose first language is Mohawk, you want to do everything you can to protect those speakers. Learned that from the Hawaiians. So we started a whole other school where I didn't have prep coverage or lunch coverage, and it was a blessing because I sat there and ate my snack with my class. I sat there and ate lunch with those kids, and we had awesome conversations. Yes. And I took note of what it is they were trying to talk about, and I planned... I worked it into my units and lessons that when I presented them with information in math, I would use math stories that would show them the language that they wanted to use to talk about their own interests. You just tell them stories. They're always talking about lacrosse, all the boys. So I would talk about when I played lacrosse or when I went to the lacrosse game or I saw the lacrosse game on TV and this is what it was like. And then they hear it so often, eventually, they, oh, they start using it. It just start coming out because they had an opportunity to hear it. How many of you would raise your, raise your hands if you'd give up your prep coverage and lunchtime to sit with students and talk with them? Yeah, very rewarding. You know, ending it and like da 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 da, you know, with the question or like just pauses and stuff like that. And especially in doing it where there's um, where there's tonal marks where you're supposed to go up or down in speech according to like where the tonal mark is or like where the glottal stop is, you know, where you talk. And it's hard to be away with your speech patterns that you like. How how do you like knock that out? <laughs> Singing. So our learners who uh, know our so we have um, we have about 25 social dance songs. We have a whole bunch of ceremony songs. We have a whole bunch of feast songs, and each one of these songs can have tens or even hundreds of verses that are all different. And so our people, uh, it's a lot of memory work to sing a song that has 108 verses in a set order. But those songs have words. They have the sounds of our language. They have the cadence, they have the pronunciation, and even if I don't know how to read and write, if I can sing those songs, I'm going to have a pretty good accent in Mohawk. And I'm not sure if Plinget has, has songs like that that you could learn to sing. The other thing is recitation, and this is a method of teaching um, where you create um, verses, songs, poems, riddles, different things. Uh, narrative forms definitive or distinct to your language where um, the kids recite or you would recite 
or you would listen to a tape and then you recite. Or you would watch a video and then you recite. Should, like, do you ever find yourself though, like ending a sentence that shouldn't end, mm -hmm. like it going up and down mm -hmm. ever, like you would in English? Not anymore. Well, it takes time. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was maybe seven or eight years into my own learning Tlingit before right. I had an elder say to me, wow, you sound, you sound like a Tlingit speaker. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, like, yes. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, uh, it's like that thing yesterday when I learned it. Um, but then the more confident they are, the less bad camping they sound. If that's each other. I mean, like, are you bad camping? <laughs> so, yeah, like, I follow. I follow. Uh, but then the, when they become more confident, they sound. For language modeling comes in. Huge. They have to be able to hear the language, hear what it's supposed to sound like. And if you're on your own in your classroom or in your house and you're the only one talking to them, so I came up with all these other, like I had a classroom mascot, which was a robin. It was a hand knitted robin doll. And so I used to talk to it every morning. And he would fly and he would tell me things and I would share it with the class because there was no other speaker there. So I, I had to come up with a way to model the language for my learners. Kids are smart. They pick it up. Like that. Um, how do you deal with uh, teachers' burnout? <laughs> teacher burnout, and how do you deal with it? Quit. Um, there's, this is where your administration has to come in for support of your school, where they're going to say, OK, the community is saying, we want our kids to speak the language. Principal takes it to the board. We want to change our mandate of our school. We want the kids to speak the language. OK, what do you need? Well, we need help. Who can help you? The Hawaiians. OK, what are they doing? They're doing this. OK, let's do that. Mohawks, what are they doing? They're doing this. Clinkets, what are they doing? They're doing this. OK, so let's make our own. What do we want? What do we need? Boom, done. Teachers. We need um, to be teaching differently. We need um, rotation. We need um, prep time. We need uh, PD days on this. We need, you know, you have to plan for it. And it, just, it won't happen overnight. Um, yeah, teacher burnout definitely happens. That's like your own personal self-care too. Cut wood for a few hours. Anybody else? Who's exhausted? <laughs> Who found the session useful? Yes. Yum. Thank you. Um, so I thank you all for listening. Talk to you again.